So we'll start today a little bit non-traditionally with a Rails 5 upgrade release um, information. Um, I, I hope Patricia will be okay to share some information with you about this. And then we will continue with our guest speaker, who is today Wayne Peters from the Imperial College London. Um, thank you very much for being our guest speaker today. And as usual, we'll um, just offer you um, loads of space to ask Wayne questions as well as ask us questions. And we'll just update you on everything we have been working on recently. So I'll just mute myself. Um, and Patricia, if you would like to share maybe a few Rails 5 upgrade information, I'll let you to go. Yeah, I, I think uh, because it's the, the big thing that happened, um, a bit of information on that first, and we can pick it up in more detail later would be good. Um, so most of you might have noticed that uh, DMP Online was down on Friday, and um, that was because we um, finally did the big upgrade to the, the Rails 5 um, code base that I think we've been we've been talking about since I joined this team. So uh, the good news is that uh, you know this is now done. Um, but uh, as it is with big upgrades, um, you, you prepare as much as you can and then you still you know hit some issues and some um, things pop up that aren't working that uh, you know you weren't aware of before. So uh, we know there are issues and thank you to everyone who's let us know. And um, basically our team of developers is, is going through the list of um, things that uh, you ha all have been reporting and uh, are fixing those as, as quickly as they can. Um, if you hit things, uh, hit issues, anything isn't working, please let us know. Um, you know, we can't fix what we don't know about and uh, there are some things that, that work for us. Um, Shibboleth login, for example, is an issue for some institutions and works super smooth for us Edinburgh people. So we don't know what, what, what's the issue there, but uh, if, if you don't report that things like that to us, um, we, we don't see them. So sometimes it's like we're quirks in the, in the system where while we're testing on our end, we won't be able to pick up on all the bits and pieces unless you tell us. So um, thank you very much for those who are putting in reports. Um, thank you also for the for the paid patients uh, in, in bearing with us while we're fixing all the bits. Um, and yeah, that's just a, a bit of a, a explanation if you use it, if you were wondering why the system was down or um, if you're coming across things. Um, this is the, the big upgrade. And uh, once that's out of the way, we hope that uh, we can go um, address some, some of your uh, other uh, wishes and uh, ideas that have been um, going around. So we'll, once that's out of the way, we'll, we'll go back to a bit of a more uh, traditional way of, uh, of addressing things. Um, Magdalena will publish later uh, this week a full list of all the new features and changes that this upgrade brings. Um, so that that is to come, but at the moment, um, you know, as we not not all aspects are working yet. Um, uh, we'll we'll just go through and uh, make sure we we explain all the new features and the bits that are coming in properly, um, and that that's coming. Um, later this week um, with hopefully all the issues um, addressed that have been popping up so far. So just wanted to, to address the elephant in the room, basically um, the, the fact that the system isn't perfectly working at the moment. Um, but yeah, as I said, like, thank you for, for those reporting. Thanks, Diana, for putting up um, the contact email in uh, the chat again. So this is where uh, where you should send your error reports if you're hitting anything. And if there are no further comments and issue on that right now, I think we can go back to the uh, normal 
order in how these uh, sessions usually run and anything else we can pick up in the uh, more general Q&A to, to us as the team later on. So thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Patricia. Um, so we will just continue. And like Patricia already said, we, we will be publishing a blog post about, you know, all the exciting features that will be coming. So hopefully that will be more informative. Uh, but we, yeah, like Patricia said, please do send us some emails if you're hitting any bugs. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, quickly Wayne. And um, I think Wayne, I already shared with you the rights to be co-host. So if you have any anything you want to share on your screen, hopefully you will be able to do so. Um, so Wayne is the research data manager, manager for library services at Imperial College London, a post he has held since December, 2018. He has previously worked as a research support librarian research data coordinator and research governance officer that can verify that RDM support is indeed an imposter syndrome profession. Wayne has a master's degree in cinema and television, and in a previous life, he was an occasional film studies lecturer. This is a short bio I received from Wayne, so thank you for, for making it sweet. Um, and I'll just mute myself and I'll, I'll let you speak now. Oh, you are muted. It still seems to be muted a little bit. Um, Can you hear me? Yes, it works now. Yeah, sorry, it's the, the headphones. So sometimes the uh, various systems seem to have trouble picking it up. Yeah, sorry, I haven't produced, presented on uh, Zoom before, so I, you may have to give me some clues on what I do next on how to share my screen. So um, when you when you look at the screen, I'm not sure whether you're using the application or the um, through window sort of. Um, I'm, on the, I'm in the window at the moment by the looks of it. I, I, I believe both should have the bottom bar where it says mute, stop video, security participant chat, and there should be share oh, screen. Oh yeah, share button. screen, got it, yep. Uh, so, let me see, share. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yeah, it works perfectly. Okay, all right, so let me just go into present. I'll try to go into present mode for the, uh... okay, so is that, can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so a quick bit of um, background then. So I've optimistically titled this planning for an integrated approach to research data management services, which is much grander than what I'm actually going to present, but um, you know, aim high. Um, so about the college, so um, it's a research intensive university. Uh, as far as I could tell, looking at last year's stats, there's about 2,364 research staff but an annual research, in, research income of 350 million pounds. Uh, there are four faculties, science, engineering, medicine, business school. Uh, we're also a founding partner in the Imperial College Healthcare Trust. So heavily STEM focused and a high, uh, health research is a high profile, which um, that, you know, and all the challenges that that brings in terms of managing um, research data. Uh, so in terms of library support for research data management, the research data management team sits within the scholarly communications management team within library services. And so that's one uh, full-time research data manager myself and a full-time senior scholarly communications assistant with special responsibilities for research data. So when I say full-time, they also help out and support other members of the team. So it's almost two full-time staff devoted to research data management, but not quite. And we're responsible for the usual kind of um, activities, so guidance and support for all aspects of research data management, including help with writing data management plans, and also raising awareness of RDM through kind of advocacy and outreach um, activities. In terms of support for data management plans, so we have a dedicated web page. We, uh, we offer one-to-one -one consultations, which can be booked online. We run a DMP online training workshop for postgraduates um, once a term. 
So this is aimed at PhD students who aren't actually required to um, complete a data management plan. So uptake isn't high. We have, we are looking at planning a similar session for postdocs, um, which I would suspect is probably more relevant. Um, although I will touch on later if we have time, I'll mention that we, we are planning to encourage at least postgraduates to complete data management plans. So the, the current training um, workshop may actually you know, gain more kind of relevance in, at a future date. We have the basic subscription to DMP online. So we've got customized templates, theme guidance, and I recently started experimenting with conditional questions. So that's kind of where we are. Now, when I was asked to, um, whether I would, would, be, uh, would like to do a presentation at the drop-in session, it was quite a long time ago, and I was optimistic that I would have some concrete sort of thing that we've done since then that I could talk about and say, look how the wonderful work we've done. That hasn't really happened. Um, I mean, the pandemic didn't help, um, but I don't think that was the only reason. So what I thought I would do, I'd highlight some of the challenges we face and, and sort of just share some of my thinking about how I would like to go about trying to meet these challenges. Um, and so the two ones I've identified, and these will be very familiar from previous presentations that, um, that other people have given at these drop-in sessions. So one is how can we raise awareness of library support for DMPs and increase the usage of DMP online? Um, but also how can we use data management plans to integrate library support for RDM with existing admin workflows, such as research ethics, information governance, and ICT? And I have specifically kind of um, focused here on admin workflows. Um, there was a, a, a paper, of, uh, sorry, a, a I don't say a paper, um, a, a post um, added to the uh, TU Delft blog page yesterday, which I know Magdalena and Patricia will be aware of because they were involved or credited as one of the people involved in the, the project it refers to, uh, which was a description of attempt to integrate um, data management plans with existing kind of platforms and systems. I think that's something that all of us would like to happen and would aspire to, but I think at the moment it's, 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 it's very, it's, it's, it's a long way off in the future for us at the college. So I am kind of focusing here mainly on admin workflows, um, which I think is also the case for previous presentations on this topic. So, so what I did, um, I did a, a kind of uh, a conceptual mapping exercise. So that's what I thought I'd share with you today. This is this is something I literally um, literally finished two minutes before I logged into this session. So this is kind of like it was something I put together for this session. So it's the first go at this. Um, and I was hope, I thought it might be useful just to share my thinking for people who are in a similar situation for us, or maybe have already started along this road, um, and may have done something um, similar. So, so this was the kind of diagram that I came up with, and I say it's an attempt to really kind of identify, I guess, the, the different variables involved in trying to think about if, if I, you know, in terms of trying to meet the challenges identified in the previous slide, what do we have to take into account? And this, to me, is like the first step before you then actually look at how you're going to implement what you want to do. It's kind of like have a, a map of what it is that you're trying to do. Um, so you can see, so I've kind of done it as a sort of a swim, uh, the swim lane kind of uh, model. Um, so you can see at the top of the, of, of the diagram is the project phase. So what I've done is just broken it down to a very simplified version of the research life cycle. Uh, project application, project startup, project management, publish and disseminate. And I found that doing this using the research life cycle was more productive than the research data life cycle, because this is about trying to integrate RDM support with existing research support services rather than the other way around. Um, so the next then kind of layer I added was then to identify some data activities that were relevant to the challenge challenges that I'd set myself in the previous slide. So under project application and project startup, you've got writing a data management plan, submitting for ethical approval, and completing a data protection impact assessment. Um, and under project management, I've highlighted data storage and security. So obviously this isn't exhaustive. There are lots of other activities that I could have included under here, but I just wanted to focus say on those aspects which were relevant to the challenges I'd set myself. And under publish and disseminate, I've just kind of put data archiving, sharing activities more generally. Uh, so the next strand there, or the next part there, then was to try and identify the different kind of teams or uh, stakeholders in the college who, who help to provide support for those activities. So the vertical columns kind of show where you've got more than one um, support service providing um, you know, support for an activity and the horizontal block then shows where there are potential 
for building pathways between different services across the research life cycle. Um, so the research office um, are the, the owners of the research data management policy. So they're responsible for monitoring and compliance of things like data management plans. Um, so the research data machine, the data team are not the, the data management police force. That's not our job. We're there to support, provide support in helping to write data management plans, but not to in, enforce any mandates. The college's research data management policy does state that all PIs should have a data management plan with projects, um, the funded projects. Um, that's, I think, still an aspirational rather than an actual kind of thing, that there's no mechanism in place to enforce compliance at the moment, um, which does have some relevance in terms of implementing the kind of integration that I, I, I'd like to bring about. Um, ethical approval. So there are two routes to ethical approval, two main routes, depending on whether it's NHS related research or non uh, NHS related research. But the first port of call is the research governance and integrity team in the research office. For a DPIA, again, there are two routes, one through health, the information governance team in the Faculty of Medicine, Medicine have a SharePoint site dedicated to uh, data protection, and also a, they've created a tool to help researchers complete with DPIA. If it's non-health, the information governance in, in the Central Secretariat also have a web page and a word template for DPIA, um, and advice and guidance comes from the Faculty Data Protection Coordinators. Uh, under data storage and security, the, that's the responsibility of ICT. So they, they provide a dedicated storage platform called the Research Data Store, uh, which is available to research with funded projects. There are some, some temporary storage that's available, I think, for people who don't have funded projects. So you can, for like a, a short period, you can upload a large volumes of data for analysis, but otherwise it's for projects that have a, a funding, allocated funding code. And finally, under data archiving and sharing, so that's one of the areas where the research data management team have core responsibility in terms of guidance and support. So I think one of the useful, useful um, outcomes of doing this kind of exercise is for me is to identify where is it that the, the research data management team and library service take ownership and where is it that they're more likely to re refer or delegate um, responsibility. So, so obviously our guidance and our training covers all aspects of data management across the life cycle. But often during the kind of active phase, we're probably more likely to be referring to other services like ethics, information governance, um, and, and ICT. So it's, it's, it's kind of at the beginning and the end of the cycle, really, where I think the, the research data management team kind of say claim ownership and say these are the areas, data management plans, uh, guidance on archiving and, and publication sharing. I've also included the research computing service under that. So at, the, at Imperial, we have, um, we do have a college of a data repository. It was built originally for the chemistry department, but it's been made available across the college as a whole. But there's some uncertainty about whether that really is going to be our long term solution, whether it's we're going to go with like an in house repository or go with a third party. I mean, I have to say that I only know of two instances of, of universities that have kind of gone with in house, and I happen to have worked at both of them. Um, and um, my own feeling is that probably in the end, it will be a third party solution of, of some kind. But we do have at least, I mean, I think as a chemistry repository, it will definitely stay, and it may stay as a kind of uh, um, as, an, as an option. Um, so I've been somewhat tentative about that. Okay, so that kind of maps out, or at least an attempt to map out where the library service sort of sits in relation to other aspects of research support within the college. So the next aspect then is, well, how to then to kind of address those challenges which I mentioned before. Um, so the first one then is about how to raise awareness of DMP is how to increase usage of DMP online. Because when we, we've had DMP online, I, well, obviously this is before I was in Imperial, so I imagine it's been for quite a few years now, but the uptake still isn't that high. And we still don't really get to see that many data management plans, you know, considering how much research goes on in the college. Um, and I've tried various things like kind of you know, attending um, meetings for a faculty or department or you know, research group meetings, tried sort of targeted communications, but they don't really, they, they haven't really had that much impact. Um, and I agree with previous speakers, like, um, for example, Michelle at St. George's made this point that it, it really, you have to try and target researchers at the point where they need the service that you're, you're offering. Um, so that's why I think it's kind of uh, important to try and think about um, these kind of working sort of relationships with other services. And I think the, the work that's in, that um, Michelle described at St. George's has been one area which I think has been 
quite influential in my thinking about how we might proceed with this. Um, particularly the distinction that they make between the uh, targeting researchers at the project application stage or at the project startup stage. Um, so one of the questions that you, you kind of have to then ask, ask and think about this is, do you actually want to enforce the mandate that all researchers have a data management plan at the application stage? So I know when Mary was speaking about the work they're doing at Glasgow, she mentioned that they do require all projects to have um, a DMP. Whereas uh, Michelle was saying that they basically target where it's a mandate from a funder. And my own feeling is that probably we would initially would go with the latter and just target where it's a funder of DMP is required as part of the application. There are several reasons for that, but not least is one of the challenges you face when wanting to raise, you know, the uh, use of your services is you don't want to be suddenly finding yourself swamped with masses and masses of um, data management plans. So as I said, we've got, you know, just under like two full-time staff. We don't receive many data management plans, but when they do come through, that sometimes they can be quite complex, especially if it's related to clinical trials and things like that. So it's trying to find that balance between raising the, the, the use of our service to kind of justify that we exist and justify that our payments are DAP online, but at the same time, we don't do under swamp. So I think an incremental approach at the beginning is probably what we would try and follow. Um, so similar at the startup phase, um, Ideally, we would want everyone who is awarded funding to submit a complete a data management plan. But initially, we might, again, I think, follow the, the kind of path that um, Michelle um, said that they were doing at St. George's and focus on those projects where a data management plan is a project deliverable. So Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, um, as it will be. So there, the kind of admin work, though, is really is thinking about how we then work with the research office, because they're the people that have access to the data about when funded, when applications are awarded, when projects, um, sorry, when applications go through and when um, projects uh, funding are awarded funding. Um, so in, the, in principle, that should be relatively easy to do. Really, the question is about whether it's, whether we, whether the research office notifies us at the appropriate time or whether we just have access to the data so we can go in and then find out who the researchers are that we need to target. And so I so say, in theory, I think that should be easy to do. The, the college has recently acquired Work Tribe as its kind of research admin system. So it, these kind of things, it should be um, relatively easy to do that. So that's one aspect of um, what this mapping exercise to do was to try and think about how we can say raise awareness of DMP support. The other aspect, the other side of that is then how can you make use of the data you collect with a data management plan to be able to then pass it on to the other services that might be able to make use of that information. And there, the kind of inspiration really is coming from the work that Manchester have been doing. I think Chris is actually here uh, attending this drop in as well. And, and Chris gave a presentation not so long ago on the work they're doing, or have been doing at Manchester. And so, just to those of you, most of you, I think, are familiar with this, but so they have a, like an outline plan that accompanies the a full data management plan. And the outline plan can capture information which can then be of use to uh, information governance, ICT. And I think they also, if someone needs ethical approval, they're um, their advice to, I don't know if they're mandated, but advice to include a data management plan with their ethical approval. And I think Reading do something similar like that. Um, so again, so that's something that we're kind of interested in doing. So how can we kind of, and how we, how we will implement will obviously depend on conversations that I might have with the other teams. But there is already a pathway in existence between the, the information of research governance integrity and the information governance team in the faculty of medicine. So there's already, if someone applies for ethical approval um, with a health related project, they're, they're advised to then contact the information governance team for the DPIA. So it's a, so we can then, so, so what we want is how can we build a similar pathway perhaps into the faculty of medicine or the data protection coordinators. Um, so Obviously, if we had um, machine actual data management plans and we could integrate the system, we could export the data from one system to another. That, that's not going to happen in the future and then in the short term. Um, and also the, the information research governance and the uh, information governance teams, they already have established workflows and, and sort of procedures in place to capture this information, which we don't want to interfere with. So we're probably looking at sort of capturing some minimal information from using with using data management plans to capture some basic information about, you know, are you working with human participants? Are you collecting personal data? Are you collecting special capacity data? And then we can probably then refer them to the relevant teams for, for future action. Again, how that will actually be implemented will depend on discussions with the other teams. Uh, when I was at King's, where I worked as in research governance when the GDPR was being implemented, 
and uh, was responsible for maintaining the, the data asset register. So what we did was there, we had a series of questions there, which would ask things like, say, you know, have you had ethical, have you had ethical approval? If the, if the person said they didn't know, or they said no, but the reason wasn't very persuasive, but they had the justification they gave for not having ethical approval, we would then advise them to contact research ethics. So we're probably looking at some kind of workflow like that. Again, do you automate it or do you have like an email that's sent out every time someone ticks, you know, no on the box in DMP, DMP online, or do we just refer them? Those, those are the details probably to be worked out, so sorry, to be worked out. But one question on this is I still haven't started also is, so what I've did, what I've done is I've added a separate section to the customized template to for legal and ethical information, which I can capture this kind of information. So the question is, do we do we add a, an additional section to the other Thunder templates in DMP Online that we're able to customize? Do we add those as, as individual questions within sections? Um, and if I think I'm right in saying, Patricia and Magdalena can get me on this, at the moment you can't actually copy and paste from one template to another. So we would manually have to do this for each one. So again, is that is that a, a good use of our time? Would it be better to actually download all the templates and copy and paste them outside of DMP Online? So I, I don't know. So there's questions about that. So that that would be that would be that's what we're hoping to do, and then that allows us to say to build those pathways between the the library and the research governance and the other kind of and the data protection coordinators and so on coordinators. And one of the reasons why I think this is important is that a lot of the time, one way of doing this is to build up kind of networks um, with people you know who 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 work in the teams and build up kind of informal relations. But of course, the trouble is people leave. Um, also, job positions, departments get restructured. Um, job positions disappear or get kind of amalgamated with other ones. So, so having some kind of more formal kind of way of managing these kind of relationships of pathways, I think, is is is, is really crucial. Um, so, I think those those were the main kind of ones that were in scope uh, when I was was started to do this mapping process. But there's a few others which would be useful to think about as well. Um, and again, it might be interesting to see what other, other people are doing. So one is to have another pathway that goes to ICT. So if the data management plan tells you that there is gonna be a, uh, large volumes of data or sensitive data might require a, a, a secure environment, then you want to be able to refer that information to, uh, refer them to ICT. At the moment, the, the way that you, you would do that is that the college has a kind of um, college-wide uh, communications got a query system so you have to raise a ticket with ICT and it gets forwarded to the research computing service I, ideally we would like to have more of a direct pathway um, what I would like to see happen is actually is that anyone who who requests access to the research data store would have to supply a copy of the data management plan if they already have one or complete a basic data management form before they have access to the research computing service and finally on that it would be nice to have some kind of link between the the research data storage and the repository so that at the end of project, if someone does want to deposit in the college repository rather than a, say, a disciplinary repository, they can also, you know, it's, it's easy for them to transfer the data to the, the repository, but they should also be a, a recommended that they should include the data management plan if they have a copy, because then when we go to review the data and metadata, we can see if it says, oh, they worked with human participants, they were collecting personal data, we can bear that in mind when we review the data and metadata. So that, Sorry, I kind of rushed through that because I'm, I'm kind of wary of time as well. Um, and as I say, this is very much something I did like the last week. So this is very much a first go at this. But I, I just thought it might be interesting. It may not be. I don't know to share the kind of thought process of trying to work towards trying to get a bigger picture of this before I then contact the teams to the different stakeholders and so on to think about how we might implement it. And just briefly, one last thing I've mentioned, there's another project I've been involved in, which was um, a proposal to recommend that students, uh, postgraduate students, deposit their thesis data in a repository at the end of their project. I include in my report on this. I included a proposal that they should be asked to uh, write a data management plan as well. The postgraduate research quality committee. I can never remember which way the words go on that. Um, they stopped short of making it mandatory, but they did agree that um, th that it should be a recommendation for postgraduate students to complete a data management plan. So ideally, this would be done. Let's say the, the kind of the confirmation review process. They would be at least they have the opportunity to upload a data management plan as, uh, as one of the documents they um, upload for that. Which I think Sheffield, I think, uh, um, have done that. Um, so that's that's something which 
would also like to do to try and bring data management plans into the, the, the postgraduate workflows for PhD students as well. Um, so finally, um, as you can tell from the way I was speaking, the, the work that other people are doing this has proved invaluable and it's really kind of, and I just wanted to acknowledge that, that that's a, been a big key, um, a, a really kind of, you know, useful, but the, the presentations and blog posts and things that other people have done is it's, it's been really crucial in, in enabling me to be able to think about what the kind of different ways we might be able to go about um, meeting those challenges. And if anyone is interested in anything I've been talking about, would like to talk to me about it in more detail or whatever, or, or give me some better ideas, um, I've included my um, email address uh, on the slides as well. So I shall stop sharing, Magdalena, and love for questions, if that makes sense. Thank you so much, Wayne. This was this was fantastic and it was so lovely. At the end, you were like referencing other, other guest speakers and blog posts. I'm, I'm so glad to see uh, these are being used by the community. We received uh, two comments in the chat. So Mary, would you like to unmute yourself? You could either say it to yourself or I can just read it. Yeah, I just, it was, sorry, can you hear me okay? It's very quiet. I don't know if I, I mean, maybe, uh, need to move my, my microphone. That's, That's better. Um, no, it was just a, a very brief click correction. At Glasgow, we don't require all projects to have a da data management plan at the application stage. We just think that would be completely oh, unworkable. Right. Um, what we do ask in our policies is that all projects that generate data should have a data management plan. But that's once they're beyond funding. So the only ones that require a DMP right. at the application stage are the ones where the funders require it. Yeah. And also this policy, it's still aspirational for us too. Right. Um, we've got no way to enforce it for staff because we're a support team, we're not the police. Um, we can enforce it for students. It's mandatory for postgraduate students and it's caught at their first year review. So it's a mandatory piece of paperwork that they need to submit at first year review. So that's the only properly mandatory Right. Um, data management plan that we have again we recommend it for people that are collecting personal data as part of our um sensitive data workflow but we have no way of making people do that okay okay yeah thanks for that i obviously misunderstood when you um, from the previous presentation yeah. that that makes sense yeah no, th thank you very much mary um and diana our colleague uh, would you like to unmute yourself I'm sorry, I was merely um, summarizing what uh, Wayne said, um, how to improve uptake, and um, he gave two sample strategies, uh, target projects at application stage and then target projects at startup stage. Um, Mary has just explained their policy, um, and I just ended up with a question that Wayne also asked, should DMPs may be made mandatory and how? <laughs> Um, you know, if, if your support teams, it will be difficult for you to impose legislation to that level. Um, I, was, I was merely summarizing what um, has been addressed. But yeah, if anybody has any other examples um, of how this is embedded within their systems and um, whether, you know, there are examples of uh, DMPs being made mandatory for somebody uh, at the stage in the uh, research uh, project, please give examples for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. As I just mentioned for Glasgow, we've made it mandatory for, for postgraduate students and that's relatively straightforward to do and the university were keen to do that, but I can't see how we could do it for anybody else, any other groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to you know, just know how many so I think there are some, I'm trying to think, I know it may be that, maybe it is more common for, 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 their, for or more easier for their institutions to be able to make it mandatory for postgraduates. And uh, at LSC, it's mandatory for master's students, isn't it, as well? So they do get a lot of, a lot of plans. Um, and, and I wonder, because well, I mean, the, the, the college has had their policy since I think 2015. Dean, I think the first version of the data management policy. So in a sense, it's a long time to have a policy that's aspirational rather than active. Uh, but I don't think that's unusual. I mean, it was the same at King's that we had a similar situation at King's. So I, I doubt if it's unusual across the board. No, I don't think it is. I think it's a like, you know, general theme around um, policies. Same for funder policies, I mean, beyond like submitting something uh, 
at the application stage, how, how many funders actually follow up on, is the will the data be shared at the end in much detail? I mean, there's like, you know, some, some reporting into research fish at certain periods of time, but I don't think it's really um, down to, to a level that you would call it proper compliance police and enforcement. At least that's based on my experience. They were still like, um, I encountered like enough researchers that were funded and didn't, weren't aware that there was a policy because obviously like no one has ever pointed out all the details to them. So, and if it's the, you know, the funders that are giving you the money that don't enforce it, it's really difficult to make that case in, in, uh, in, in a library team some, um, um, to, to be stricter than the people actually giving you the money for no good reason. And then the question is, is it, is it worth that? Or do you actually want to, want to be the, the helpful support partner? Um, I mean, as, as Mary said, you, you actually like, none of the librarians or like, or research data support teams I've come across uh, with really want to be the police, so. Yeah, and as yep. I say, we're, we're not the um, owners of the policy, so it's not our responsibility anyway. But also, like most people, you know, we, we we try to encourage people to think of data management plans as a as a positive, you know, a tool that they can use for their benefit, not rather than the compliance. Although the reality is that most people come to us to review data, uh, to help with data management plans because they've been asked by a funder. So it, it can be difficult. Now, however much you may want to try and assert the kind of message that this is a good thing. And a good research practice. The reality is that most people are doing it because they've been asked to do it, and it's difficult to manage or change those perceptions. I, I think. Yeah. So um, it can be counterproductive to try and kind of enforce compliance. Is partly what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, I I um, I found quite interesting one comment that you made that you um, think that it would be really helpful to have the data management plan with the deposit of a data set in the repository, and. I don't know, like, I, I think that's that's one area that's still like unexplored and that some of our colleagues at um, the DCC are, uh, are looking into as uh, some working groups of, uh, around like just generally depositing data management plans into into a repository. So I don't know if if you have a feeling of if that actually would be helpful or if people are too scared to to make that open? I think there, there, I think there are two issues there. And the one is to deposit in a repository to make them public, or second, to do them as, as what I mentioned, to help the administrative side where it provides you with information that you need. Because one of, one of the challenges, especially if you're trying to do like an, an in-house repository or, or, or use you know, existing systems as a data repository like people do, is, is, is how you review and assess the data sets and metadata you receive. And some of those challenges are about obviously not having the disciplinary knowledge to know at a kind of granular level whether the metadata is, is fair, but other is it's just being sensitive to. So when, when I got in touch with the data protection officer when we were drawing up a data deposit agreement for the repository, um, I mean, he was kind of all sorts of questions about, you know, was worried about people putting depositing disclosive information in the repository. And so there's a question whether asking people to sign a data, um, a data deposit agreement is sufficient. Um, so you, you need to have, you know, you, you, you may not be able to check every data to, to say that it gets deposited at the same kind of level, but it's probably good to be, have it flagged up if someone's depositing a data set that, were, that uh, you know, may have involved personal data at some point, it, it's good to have it flagged up and a DMP may be one way of doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um... I guess like Mary mentioned that, you know, you ask for consent forms or, or some. Um, yes, yes, yeah, that's so, something else. So that, that, that's kind of like, it's a similar thing. It's like, yes. you know, yeah. um, basically like asking for the documentation to, to make sure everything is actually yeah. consistent. And then you, you see where people are going yeah. contradicting themselves because they're writing the one thing in the data management plan Absolutely. and then yes. the consent forms don't yeah. cover it accordingly. Yeah. Um, and again, Mary highlights that in the chat that um, they had success to ask for a data management plan when anyone actually asks for for help with a data management issue. 
That's a good point. I did not yeah. think that this is like your entry point to like, what have you actually like? Recently, we've been getting, well, not recently, but we've always had emails into our service mailbox asking, you know, I want to do this. Where should I put my data? And instead of just launching into a response to their question, recently we've had a strategy of just emailing them back and going, can you send us a copy of your data management plan so we can see what you planned for? And we'll then advise accordingly. And almost always they've not got a data management plan, but the requirement for a data management plan is quite well known at Glasgow. We've done a lot of work to publicize this. So if they're then kind of caught out in this, we're asking to see it, they have to draft it. So that has worked quite nicely. Um, Obviously, if they really push back, we're still going to help them. But it has been a good nudge to get a data management plan in, in place. Sounds like a good guerrilla strategy to, to spread the word. Great. Are there any other questions for Wayne? If not, I guess that's a... Uh, thank you very much from, from us. I, I found it really useful to have someone go through the thinking and actually see how, you know, how you take all the bits and pieces that are out there and are trying to apply it, apply it to your institutional context. I think that's a, a, a really valuable exercise and um, quite sure that there are a few people that are interested in, in, in following up and, and um, also hear an update to to see how you're getting on and yes. <laughs> you're welcome to come back and report is what i'm saying yes <laughs> yeah doing the map was the easy bit <laughs> so yeah uh, that that strategic approach and uh, taking a break and looking at all the bits is, is needed sometimes so th thank you for sharing that yeah. um Magdalena, shall i go over into updates Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I think we can move forward um, with the session. And so many, many thanks, Wayne, from for myself as well. It has been fantastic. And um, you have been waiting for your presentation for quite a long time. So finally came your time around. Uh, so many things again. So we, we just thought we'll just use, um, I guess, like the last third or quarter of the session just to give you a few updates just so you know what has been going on and you know we always are open for questions and answers as well um so we we were having a roadmap team meeting at the beginning of february and with our colleagues from cdl from california uh, digital library um, and they are working on their tool which is called dmp tool and many of you will know we we work uh, together on the roadmap code and so we use this opportunity like last year just to discuss um what are our plans for the year to come and um unfortunately we couldn't do it over the course of three days like we did last year but um you know thanks to zoom and and these online tools we could have had a half day with them uh, which was very useful i'm currently working on a blog post with patricia and maria um and we'll be sharing um the, the decisions or um, how to call it the points we decided on or agreed on uh, with all of you shortly um, but it, it's been a good meeting we we divided into first we were basically discussing what has happened over the year and you know all the features we developed and then um, we split it into different groups of the project managers talking about the functionalities to come um, and then our software developers met together where they basically discussed their plans about how to collaborate. And we were having, I think, the directors uh, discussing the broader, bigger plans uh, going ahead. And um, I'll, I'll be I'll be sharing the blog post with you as soon as uh, Maria, Patricia and myself, we finish this. Um, Patricia, would you like to just maybe announce uh, the... Yeah, uh, I think like Wayne announced it already for us, which is great. <laughs> it's nice to see that that has um, already been uh, picked up and uh, uh, read. Um, so yeah, yesterday um, the colleagues at the TU Delft um, announced uh, the, that uh, we have received some some funding um, together with them for a, a little uh, project. Um, so that is from the, the Dutch um, funder SURF, which I think is like 
they are the, the people that like similar to just in the UK. So they, they do like, um, you know, add your own uh, single sign on and uh, those um, basic infrastructures. And they've given, um, given us some money to throughout 2021 um, work a bit on uh, integrating uh, data management plans with uh, some of the local systems at the TU Delft and um, just enhancing some of the features to um, make processes easier. So um, what uh, we're, we're looking in doing, so on the DMP online side is basically we're uh, looking to enrich the integration with um, something called Surf Connect. So that's basically the um, uh, Shibboleth, the single sign-on version to just um, get more information automatically through when someone signs on. So um, things like their their department, their, um, their status if they're a PhD student or a staff uh, member. So that's information that's already connected to their account. And we're basically um, looking into ways to get the, and those uh, automatically into DMP online. Um, so they, um, they can use that information to better tailor their workflows, for example, around um, distributing the um, reviews for data management plans so that uh, you can, um, yeah, their, their data stewards know who's, um, who belongs to their faculty and can, can easily pick that up. And uh, on their end, um, th they basically had the, the same issue that was mentioned already. You know, you have this idea that you could potentially do quite a bit, uh, quite a few things with the, with the API and uh, using machine actionable data management plans, but you never have the proper time to look into this. So as part of that, they actually um, got funding to hire a, a developer that will really like dedicatedly work with the, the DMP online API and um, some of the systems on the TU Delft side. One is their um, system for data protection assessments um, and or, or slash ethics. And um, the other one is uh, to integrate with their um, uh, local IT service and the storage allocation there. So um, the idea is that that might be, you know, might be tailored to Delft, but the, the idea is that the, all the scripts and um, code that is created as part of that, that will actually be, be made open. So uh, that hopefully gives then some, some other DMP online users a, a starting point to see how they could use uh, DMP online to integrate with their own systems, because sometimes, you know, it's easier to, to look at what other people have done and get an idea from there, or, and if it's just to understand what you would need to do differently to, for your, for your local system. So we're basically just kicking, kicking that off, um, but the funding runs until the end of this year. So in the second half, we hope that we have some uh, nice things to share with you. And um, as you can see with the announcement on the blog, we're, we're trying to do this as transparently as possible and actually want to communicate quite a lot with the community. Um, might be mainly Dutch users on some of the aspects, um, um, but also the the wider DMP online community on, on things like, you know, how you could use the API and lessons learned from that. So, yeah, if anyone is interested uh, uh, to know more, I think the colleagues at the TU Delft are, are willing to answer more questions if there are any, and um, as in the team, uh, are also quite happy to provide more input into what we are doing, although it is like overall it's a tiny slice of the big project. It is mainly focused on their internal systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patricia. Um, yes, yeah, so, so we have been quite busy with um, all of these activities. Um, 
I, I just wanted to now invite some of you, um, hopefully as many as possible of you, to our tomorrow's demo session uh, on review usage. I think I forgot to actually change what it says here for some strange reason. So if we maybe share the document links with you, you will be able to see the correct um, links to join us tomorrow. It's half past 10 in the morning and like I said, we with the Rails 5 have quite a lot of new uh, review uses functionalities we'll be uh, showing you as well. Um, and like usual, uh, our January 2021 newsletter is out um, and also the drop-in from January is on the YouTube and we do have all of the drop-in sessions in one YouTube playlist in case you're interested to see more. Um, and you're also more than welcome to take a party, uh, a part uh, to take the survey about our upcoming uh, demo sessions. We are trying to find out which features you would like us to demo. And as a result, we'll be also discussing this feature more with you. So if you have any suggestions about how to improve something, um, feel free to vote in our next demo session. So um, this will inform us how we plan the months ahead. And um, like usual, uh, I would like to invite whoever would like to be our next speaker uh, for months to come. Many thanks to, to Wayne uh, today to be our guest speaker. It's always much, much uh, valuable for the whole community and for us as well to learn how are you using DMP online or learning about your research practices at your institution and communication activities with your researchers. So um, if you are willing uh, to be our guest speaker, we are currently looking for guest speakers, I think from July onwards. So uh, email us to dmponline at dcc.ac.uk if you wish to take a part. Um, I'm not sure whether there are any more questions. If not, um, I'll just conclude the session um, by, again, saying massive thanks to Wayne, um, to Patricia and Diana helping me to run the session today. Um, if you are not following us on Twitter yet, do follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and do subscribe to our monthly newsletter as these are the places where we tend to discuss, um, you know, all of these events that are upcoming as well as what we have been working on and uh, we share the videos and blog posts um, there as well from the community. Our next drop-in uh, will be on the 10th of March, a half past 10 in the morning. And our guest speaker will be Lindsay Myers from the University of York. So again, um, I would just suggest to put this into your calendars now if you are willing to join us. But again, one massive big thank you to Wayne, Patricia, Diana, and I wish you all a lovely rest of today. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.